Now, we have racial divisions, which are a, a, a topic of, of concern uh, that Marx didn't discuss as explicitly, but this is part of the social justice dialogue at the present time. Now, the argument is that racial divisions occur from power imbalances, and this leads to systemic racism. The problem with this is the politics is where power imbalances come from. <clears throat> power imbalances, privileges, uh, rather than race or capitalism, are what cause these problems that people are, are concerned about, these racial divisions. Uh, I, I grew up in the segregationist South in the United States. Uh, blacks and whites were kept apart by legislation, not by human preferences. Now, it was the case that some groups used the government to create these divisions, but most people did not want to live with them. I lived in South Africa under apartheid. It was a legislatively imposed system. It wasn't a natural system of human interaction. It would segregation in the US South in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and apartheid in South Africa could not have existed and persisted without legislative support. So it was a form of state intervention. Now, the problem with this idea of systemic racism is never made clear what people believe the system is. Is the system democracy? Is the system state control? Is the system capitalism? Is it religious in origin? Um, it's never made clear. It's just that you need, you're supposed to accept that it exists. Now, if it's, it's, it's systematic, that's something different. There may be systematic racism, but it usually involves a small subgroup. Now, it turns out that in, that in the United States, there are some so-called white supremacists. These are a very small fraction of the total population. Uh, and it's not a very influential one. And there may be sy systematic, but it is not systemic in that it doesn't affect everyone. And it's not promoted by everyone. Racism in the US is not acceptable. Uh, you will not find support for racism in the United States in co local communities in states or at the federal level, uh, people generally oppose it quite vigorously. Now, it turns out that it, that it is the case that many groups express their own racial and cultural supremacy. Um, in, in many Asian cultures, uh, d d understand that they, that they have a superiority. Uh, the idea of Chinese exceptionalism goes back thousands of years. Um, Koreans have a sense of uh, racial and cultural supremacy. They believe that their culture is superior to all other cultures, all other Asian cultures. The Japanese have this idea. So it, many groups have this um, sense of a um, superiority or supremacy. Uh, and, and it's not something that is only in the mind of a, some idiot in the Ku Klux Klan. There are many other countries and, and cultures that express this. The Greeks believe that their culture, the French believe that French language and culture is superior to all other European cultures. So these kind of ideas are out there uh, and, and we, we, we should not ignore the fact that, they, that that tendency tends to be somewhat universal. Now it turns out that Collectivist thinking is what se separates people into rigid groups. I'm running out of time. I need to move along. Uh, racial identity in actually encourages antagonism. If we identify as human beings rather than a particular race or a particular uh, cultural background, we'll be less likely to view other people antagonistically. Uh, we, we should not generalize because that's what a racial identity is, it's a, it, it's a, a, ge, a general understanding uh, as though we are operating as a single mind, but we're all individual humans. Uh, I, I, I don't identify as a, an American even, I, I identify as a, uh, an economist, uh, someone who 
is interested in, in, in you know, trying to identify even with a country, uh, it, it creates antagonisms. Now, most human conflicts are due to scarcity, not race. Uh, so the, the idea is that we, we're not going to escape scarcity. So if we want to solve conflict, we need to have private property if we want to have peaceful solutions. So profit seeking provides a motive for less discrimination. Because if you walk into my shop, I want to sell to you. I don't care what race you are. I have a strong incentive to sell to you. Now, if I believe that other customers will stay away because of I, I deal with you, I might uh, develop different uh, interpretations here. But in general, capitalism was the enemy. Capitalism destroyed apartheid because it was unsustainable. It went against human nature. Uh, social justice is a political concept, and it has an infinite number of diverse ideological inputs. Uh, they believe that, that there are certain systemic failures, in particular of capitalism, that leads to unjust outcomes. Uh, they demand that the state uh, impose e equity and egalitarianism, but that relies on coercive redistribution and restrictions on private property. Th their solutions are actually making matters worse. Now, the again, you need to, if you're going to talk about systemic failures and systemic injustices, you need to identify the system that causes it. Now, my understanding is that most of the big problems are where we restrict the ability of people to control their private property and their own private destiny. Uh, so what happens is that the people who you might call social justice warriors have a clear means that is the state coercive redistribution, but they don't have objective distinctive or fixed ends. The ends are, are all over the map. Now, generally, they try to portray people as being part of a homogeneous group. Now, now if, if I'm considered a part of the white privileged group in the United States, I'm lumped in with white Hispanics, with Jewish individuals, uh, with uh, rednecks from the South, with uh, elite uh, public school uh, Princeton Ivy League graduates, uh, people from Appalachia, they're poor whites. It's an incoherent idea. There's no homogeneity. It, it, to, to, to talk about whites in the United States is really an incoherent idea because you're trying to make some sort of homogeneous collective that's absolutely impossible. I have very little in common with the people in Appalachia who live in the uh, some deep valley who are in, deeply impoverished. I have very little in common with the Princeton uh, graduate that lives in New York City working for McKinsey Stewart or whatever. Um, I have, may have more in common with my black neighbor who I grew up with in the, in the South in, in, in the US or that I worked with. Now, so justice, as a social outcome, if you really wanted to have a real social outcome, it's only going to be accomplished by treating each individual equally and trying to get away from these uh, contrived differences based on class or race. We don't want to lump humanity into these categories because when we do, we lose sight of their humanity and what it is. And their humanity is their right to be able to live their life as they choose and to be able to discover what it is they can do that will make your life better off. Now, so let me quickly saw, and I, I've run over time here, I apologize. Now, when we complain about uneven power under capitalism, we ignore the fact that the real problem is political power. I, I don't fear Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos and Amazon cannot put me in jail. Joe Biden can. Uh, the governor of my state can. And if they want to act arbitrarily, I have to hope that the courts will support my, my rights, but they may not. Now, if Jeff Bezos tries to do anything to force me 
uh, I can ignore him or I can seek uh, remedy. And it's almost certain that the courts will and the, the police will uh, remedy that. So what we need to be worried about is political power. Political power is persistent and permanent. And it creates inequalities that are persistent and permanent. Capitalism creates inequalities that are contested. Nobody knew Jeff Bezos' name 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Nobody cared who, about who Bill Gates was or Jack Ma. What we find is that over time, I mean, people heard of Rockefeller or Ford or Carnegie, but these people, their wealth is insignificant compared to the wealth of the people who've acquired it uh, through, and, and even now through uh, Bitcoin. We've got Bitcoin billionaires now. Uh, so economic power is contested and transient. Nokia used to be a telephonic powerhouse. Uh, Blackberry, but these are, have been swept aside. Markets destroy monopoly positions. And, uh, and it's quite clear if you think through uh, Netscape, uh, maybe none of you even remember or, or ever heard of Netscape, uh, or My, uh, MySpace, which was a social media platform that existed before Facebook. It was going to take over the universe, but it disappeared. So, but state intervention divides people and politicizes life outcomes. So if inequality that's used to expand political power, if it's used as an excuse, that means people will have less freedom and they'll have fewer resources at their disposal. And it turns out that if we look, at tax revenues have seldom reduced inequality or improved the quality of life. Um, Governments promise to do these things, but uh, in the United States, we, we had a war on poverty started by Lyndon Johnson back in the 1960s. At that time, we had roughly uh, less than 20% of the population uh, were deemed to be poor. Today, it's about the same. So, and despite the fact we had trillions of dollars of expenditures and taxes, we have not been able to uh, reduce that number. But it turns out, of course, those people are much better off than they were in the 1960s. And the, the people that are considered poor in America would be considered at least middle class in countries like India or China. Uh, so political action uh, provides privileges and subsidies to one group in exchange for electoral support. Now, if we want to have better outcomes, we need less state intervention. In other words, we need more markets. If we have less state intervention, there's more freedom of choice. Business startups will occur. More jobs will be created, more options and better conditions for workers, less absolute and relative poverty. One of the great, the pandemic policies have done two terrible, terrible things. The first is that they've reversed the persistent decline in absolute poverty. Absolute poverty is going up for the first time in the, over the last 30 or 40 years. And that's because of pandemic, not because of COVID, it's because of the policy choices. It didn't have to be this way, governments chose for that. The other thing that is, and it's not irreversible, but it's a very damaging outcome of these pandemic policies is that it's destroyed trust between human beings. Instead of seeing each other as someone we can cooperate, cooperate with in order to make our lives better off, we now see each other as a dangerous vector of a disease. Uh, we don't trust each other. We're afraid of each other. Capitalism taught people to respect each other, to, to, to value each other. These pandemic policies have taught us to fear each other. And this is one of the terrible outcomes of these policies. 